live start. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the world. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Nori Kuratani, a pediatric anesthesiologist from Japan. I'm also acting as a pediatric anesthesia committee chair of WFSA, a World Federation of Society of Anesthesiologists. It is my great pleasure and honor to be one of the moderators in this uh, webinar. I would like to thank Professor Shigemi. Uh, Professor Shigemi is uh, Congress Chairman of JSPA 2023 for uh, giving us such a wonderful opportunities to have a webinar co-hosted by uh, WFSA and uh, JSPA 2023. Our topic today is focused on the role of anesthesia in pediatric cancer care. Pediatric cancer is rare. However, the impact of pediatric cancer is significant to both the young patients and their families. Anesthesia plays very important role in managing pediatric cancer, ranging from surgical interventions procedural sedations, and the pain management. In this webinar, speakers around the world will discuss the diverse roles of anesthesiologists in pediatric cancer care. Our goal is to enhance deeper understanding of the importance of anesthesia in pediatric cancer care, and also uh, in facilitate uh, deeper discussions in this important field. We are excited to have uh, participants around the world via uh, YouTube, and we warmly welcome all of you. We also encourage the participants to ask questions, make comments, and to share your insights and experiences with us. If you have comments or questions, you can submit your questions to YouTube chat, or you can email me directly. You can, you can find my email address on the YouTube uh, website. We may address some of the questions in the round table discussion in this webinar. We hope this webinar will be both informative and uh, engaging to for everyone. Okay, let's get started. The first of all, Professor Y. Morris, the WFSA president, will give us opening remarks. Dear friends and colleagues. My name is Dr. Wayne Morris, and I am the current president of the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists, WFSA. Greetings from WFSA and greetings from my country, New Zealand. I am delighted to welcome you to this WFSA JSPA webinar entitled Anesthesia and Cancer Care in Pediatrics. This event will highlight the crucial roles that anesthesiologists play at multiple points in the care pathway for children with cancer. Pediatric cancer care is a rapidly evolving field, and it is essential that we stay up to date with the latest developments. Thank you very much to the organizers and also an amazing group of international experts from Turkey, Japan, United States and Pakistan, Honduras, France, and Mongolia. WFSA's theme for 2023 is anesthesia and cancer care, and we will be holding a, another webinar focusing on global issues relating to cancer care on World Anesthesia Day, Monday the 16th of October. Please go to the WFSA website for more details. Thank you for joining us today. Enjoy this webinar, and I look forward to seeing you at our World Anesthesia Day event.
Okay, our first speaker, Professor Saida Asa from Pakistan. She has also appointed with the Arkansas Children Hospital United States. Her topic today is anesthesia consideration for pediatric oncology patient. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Saida Asif. I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist and I divide my time between the Children's Hospital in Lahore, Pakistan, and Arkansas Children's Hospital in the United States. I'm greatly indebted to the Japanese Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists and the WFSA Pediatric Committee for inviting me to talk about the anesthesia con considerations in children with cancer. Today, my hope is that at the end of this presentation, you will be able to describe the incidence of cancer and the types of cancer in children the key preoperative concerns uh, in children presenting for surgery and the anesthesia implications of cancer therapy for children with cancer. I also want to go over tumor lysis syndrome and anterior mediastinal mass and briefly describe the global initiative to improve cancer outcomes in children and I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end. 400,000 children and adolescents develop cancer each year worldwide Cancer is the leading cause of death past infancy among children in the United States. 15,590 uh, children were expected to be diagnosed with cancer in 2021, and unfortunately, nearly 1,800 children were expected to die of cancer in 2021. Leukemias are the most common childhood tumor, followed by brain tumors and neuroblastomas. Uh, Wilms tumor, uh, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin lymphomas, rhabdomyosarcomas, retinoblastomas, and sarcomas are some other common childhood tumors. Uh, in younger infants and uh, younger um, age group, we're more likely to see neuroblastomas and retinoblastomas, and among teenagers, sarcomas and lymphomas become more common. When we look at um, cancer estimates from the cancer registry data in Japan from 2009 to 2011, so about under 3,000 ch children developed were diagnosed with cancer, and the leading causes of cancer were leukemia, brain tumors, lymphomas, and gonadal germ cell tumors. Children with cancer can uh, can present with multiple uh, challenges for the anesthesiologist. The anesthesiologist will see patients, with, uh, children with tumor, for for their initial diagnosis. And may and see them subsequently for follow for follow up treatment and even for non cancer related therapies. You they can present for both diagnose diagnostic and therapeutic therapies such as bone marrow biopsy, intrathecal chemotherapy, lymph node biopsy, line placements, tumor resections, and radiation. We can encounter them in the operating room or outside of the operating room, which can also which can be a challenge in itself. So when we're looking at a tumor preoperatively, I'd like to remind my residents that remember the four M's. The tumor is local effect or mass effect, any, uh, um, any complications as a result of the metastatic disease or metabolic or systemic uh, effects of the tumor or the chemotherapy itself. These children require a careful review of the labs, uh, imaging studies, such as CT scan or MRI, and a, and a uh, thorough discussion with the surgical team as to what the surgical plan is and what are the implications for potential blood loss any, in any post-op uh, requirements for that. Chemotherapy is a double-edged sword for patients with cancer. On the one hand, it provides them with the hope of cure, and on the other hand, it leads to side effects in, from the acute period to long-term uh, effects many, many decades later. If we look at, I just want to go over briefly uh, what different agents are associated with and what are their main um, uh, complications are. The anthracyclines such as doxorubicin, adriamycin, donorubicin are associated with cardiomyopathy and these children should have a preoperative echo and ECG available besides CBC. Methotrexate like other uh, chemotherapeutic agent is associated with nausea, vomiting, myelosuppression, mucositis. So you require preoperative CVC uh, for any invasive procedure 
and LFTs, if, uh, including your bilirubin and albumin. Bleomycin is associated with pulmonary fibrosis, so you need to document your preoperative sa saturation and possibly look at your chest x-ray and pulmonary function test. Cyclophosphamide again is associated with na uh, nausea, vomiting, myelosuppression, as well as cardiomyopathy and uh, pulmonary fibrosis. It's also associated with syndrome of inappropriate ADH. So these patients will require, um, should have an echo and ECG and a serum sodium um, along with an, uh, if SIADH is suspected. Carboplatin and cisplatin are associated with neurotoxicity, autotoxicity, and hemolytic uremic syndrome. Wincristine is associated with peripheral neuropathy, and these patients should have a documented pre-op neurological exam. Steroids are used frequently in chemotherapy uh, to cause tumor lysis. These patients can present commonly with hypertension or Cushing syndrome. Uh, they may also require stress dose steroids from, from adrenal suppression. As you saw on the previous slide, many chemotherapeutic agents are associated with myelosuppression and present with pancytopenia, including thrombocytopenia, and may require perioperative platelet transfusion. It depends on the type of procedure, the potential for bleeding, and the function of the existing platelet. So for example, if you, uh, the patient is coming in with a platelet count of 45,000 uh, for a central line placement, you may consider transfusing platelets as the procedure is going on or having a platelet transfusion before the beginning of the procedure. More invasive procedures such as uh, abdominal surgery may require high, higher platelet counts of 80,000 to 100,000. Neuroexal anesthesia is contraindicated if thrombocytopenia is present. Um, as a part of the pancytopenia, these patients do have chronic anemia, but hematocrits in the low to mid-20s are generally well tolerated. If these patients require treatment, consider irradiated RBCs to prevent graft versus host disease and leukodepletion to prevent transmission of cytomegalovirus. So myelosuppression can lead to profound pancytopenia and Neutropenic patients who have less than 500 uh, cell count are at an increased rate for bacterial and viral infections. Uh, as a part of our anesthesia care, we must be aware of this risk. These, uh, we need to observe protective and reverse isolation, observe strict hand washing and aseptic te technique during any procedures and medication administration, and, the, and we cannot place rectal probes or any rectal administration of medication. Anthracycline and antibiotics uh, such as doxorubicin, donorubicin, epirubicin, idorubicin, and cyclophosphamide can cause cardiotoxicity. This can range anywhere from minor changes on the ECG such as nonspecific ST T wave changes, prolongation of QT to, to arrhythmias, ventricular dysfunction, myocarditis, pericarditis syndrome, to congestive heart failure and even cardiogenic shock. Cardiac toxicity can be both early on or later. In fact, the risk of death from cardiac related events is eight times higher in uh, children who survive pediatric cancers. So like I said, they can present early in weeks or months after therapy or weeks in, or years later in the late form. We believe that this results from the oxidative damage from the chemotherapy to the heart tissue itself. The myocardial depression with congestive heart failure, unfortunately, is often not very responsive to medication. Cardiotoxicity risk is dependent on the cumulative dose uh, that the patient receive. However, in children, the heart is unable to grow, and you can see cardiotoxicity even at lower doses. So these children require follow-up with baseline and serial echocardiogram even for many years after the treatment. Intraoperative fatalities have occurred in children from chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. So as anesthesiologists, we must be aware of this risk even many years after completion of the therapy. And a cardiology consultation and echocardiographic assessment is not unwarranted in these patients. Uh, they may also have a prolongation of QT interval. So consider uh, cardiotoxicity, especially when you are um, 
choosing your induction age, induction and maintenance agents and be vigilant about possible cardiovascular collapse and post-op hypertension in the PACU. Lung damage can occur from infection, from dysregulated immune function and inflammation, and from the chemotherapeutic agents itself, such as bleomycin, uh, busulfan, cyclophosphamide. It can present some immediately in weeks following therapy or many years after the therapy itself. Bleomycin can lead to interstitial pneumonitis and pulmonary fibrosis. We must use uh, FiO2 30% or less because higher FiO2s can precipitate acute lung injury and ARDS in these patients. Mortality from this injury can be as high as 83%. Thoracic radiation can cause clinically significant lung injury in 5 to 15% of the patients. It's really dependent on the total dose of uh, radiation that's given. However, in children under three years of age, because of interference with lung and chest wall growth, we can see uh, lung injury from radiation even at a lower dose. Uh, lung uh, injury can present either immediately in the first few months after exposure, or it m may uh, evolve as pneumonitis and then subsequently fibrosis over the next year or so. 50 to 90 percent of children uh, may develop nerve injury within a few days of starting therapy with agents such as vinblastin, vincristine, uh, cisplatin, and monoclonal antibodies. They can be both sensory and motor changes and can also lead to balance or, uh, or fall risk. Neuropathic pain has to be treated with tricyclic antidepressants and gabapentinoids. These patients must be positioned uh, very carefully with padding of all the pressure points. These patients often have high opioid requirements, so addition of ketamine is very helpful. Any neurological deficit should be documented before placing a peripheral nerve block, and consider using a lower dose of local anesthetic in peripheral nerve blocks in these patients. Recent advances in immunotherapy have led to uh, these genetically modified T cells that express chimeric antigen receptors that are capable of recognizing and destroying tumors. This immunotherapy has given new hope, especially to children with relapsed or refractory B cell malignancies uh, with complete remission rates of 50 to 90 percent and even a possible curative response. CAR T cell immunotherapy was initially restricted to few large centers as an experimental therapy, but with, with this encouraging results, uh, we expect that this is going to be included in various other solid and liquid tumor protocols and uh, may be adopted at, a, uh, why, at, a, at more other hospitals as well. CAR T-cell therapy is associated with prolonged cytopenias, anaphylaxis, tumor lysis syndrome, and the risk of potentially uh, fatal infectious complications. So we must be, if, uh, we must be aware of uh, anything that we do intraoperatively that will increase this risk further. Cytokine, cytokine release syndrome uh, occurs in 70 to 94 percent of the patients uh, undergoing CAR T cell therapy. Usually uh, you see it two days after the CAR T cell infusion, but it may be delayed even up to two weeks. There is an activation of the vascular endothelial system leading to loss of vascular integrity, capillary leak, uh, eventually leading to consumptive coagulopathy and vascular smooth muscle dysfunction. CRS can represent as fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, and in more serious cases can progress to hypoxia, hypotension, coagulopathy, respiratory failure, shock, and multi-organ failure. Some of these patients may end up going to the ICU for supportive care. Second distinct adverse effect of CAR T cell therapy is neurotoxicity. There is blood-brain barrier with local, local cytokine production. Uh, it can lead to encephalopathy with aphasia. It usually starts five days post-infusion and can last up to 10 days. We see diffuse basogenic edema on uh, imaging. Uh, it can also lead to raised inflammatory cytokines on CSF fluid analysis. These patients can uh, progress to obtundation, seizures, raised ICP, and even brain herniation. Our main anesthesia concerns for patients who have undergone CAR T cell, cell therapy is that we need to know what the timing and the indication and the type of CAR T cell that was administered. If there's any coagulopathy or refractory cytopenia, avoid elective or invasive procedures because of the risk of bleeding and infection. Steroids should never be administered without talking to the oncology team because they may affect T cell uh, function. 
we must be aware of cytokine uh, release syndrome and neurotoxicity. Uh, these patients may be on anti interleukin-6 therapy or steroids or anticonvulsants um, for these uh, complications. Uh, we need to be prepared to treat any potential uh, progression to these complications with vasopressors, inotropic agents, and mechanical ventilation. Any patient who has neurotoxicity we must be prepared for increased intracranial pressure. Another dreaded complication of induction of chemotherapy is tumor lysis syndrome. With the beginning of chemotherapy, there is uh, tumor lysis, which can result in massive sudden release of intracellular contents, such as nucleic acid, uric acid, phosphorus, potassium into the circulation. As you can see on this slide, that there is an uh, acute rise in potassium with hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, um, hyperuricemia, hyperuricemia, and hypocalcemia. This is a potentially life-threatening complication that needs to be that needs to be anticipated and recognized and treated early. Usually, we see tumor lysis syndrome in large tumors with rapid rate of proliferation that are sensitive to cancer therapy, and particularly in, in Burkitt's lymphomas. Tumor lysis syndrome has also been reported in ch children who were not diagnosed. Uh, with leukemia and are, uh, were undergoing routine uh, tonsils and adenoidectomy when dexamethasone was administered leading to tumor lysis and hyperkalemia. Uh, tumor lysis has been associated in uh, leukemia again with dexamethasone administration in a patient with leukemia. So be very careful when if you decide if uh, in a patient with cancer when you are going to administer dexamethasone. Spontaneous tumor lysis has also been reported in patients with sacrococcygeal teratoma before the beginning of any chemotherapeutic agent. Hyperkalemia in tumor lysis syndrome can lead to malignant arrhythmias, and hyperuricemia can result in obstructive uropathy and acute renal failure. So in, in patients with large tumors or uh, high cell lysis uh, potential, the usually anti-tumor lysis therapy is started before uh, chemotherapy is begun with uh, aggressive hydration and diuresis, along with agents that aim to reduce hyperuricemia, such as allopurinol and rasburicase. Patients who have developed tumor lysis may be monitored more closely, and some of them may require admission to an ICU. Anterior mediastinal mass is associated with high perioperative morbidity and mortality, especially in the high-risk patients. Usually we see anterior mediastinal masses in patients with lymphomas, ALL, germ cell tumors, and teratomas. Anterior mediastinal masses can put pressure on the airway, on the heart, and this can lead to complete obstruction of the airway. It can also lead to SVC syndrome or IVC compression uh, um, along with fever, night sweats, and weight loss. So the most important thing to establish on with these patients are is whether they have orthopnea or, or, the, or any dyspnea. And if they do have any orthopnea, what is the most comfortable position for them and what is the least comfortable position for them? Uh, it is imperative that we discuss these patients in a multidisciplinary team and look at the chest x-ray, CT scan, the echocardiograph, um, and the peak expiry flow rates to see to evaluate if, if there's any obstruction, which uh, structures are being obstructed, and the degree of obstruction. Now, there is an urgency in, in their treatment because the doubling time for uh, some of these tumors is 12 hours or so. So in children who have no symptoms and no radiographic airway compression are generally con or, or cardiac or vascular compression are considered low risk. But if there's any airway compression, with uh, symptoms of dyspnea or orthopnea, but no bronchial compression. These are considered intermediate risk patients. Patients with orthopnea, strider, uh, tracheal compression of uh, more than 70%, or with bronchial compression, uh, tamponade physiology on echo, are high risk patients. In low risk patients, you can proceed with general anesthesia while preserving spontaneous ventilation and intrathoracic pressure. But in high-risk patients, you want to discuss potentially preoperative steroids or radiotherapy to shrink the size 
of the tumor and its compression on the surrounding structures. Hematology oncology team generally does not like this plan because it can alter the biopsy results for them. And we may have to proceed with a high risk uh, patient. Now in high risk patients, you have to have rigid bronchoscope available in case you're not able to ventilate the patient after induction. Um, you, uh, I, cardiopulmonary bypass is uh, advocated as a potential uh, backup strategy, but it's really difficult to set up uh, and go on bypass in an acutely deteriorating patient. In these patients, consider increasing your FiO2, adding some PEEP or CPAP to these patients, and rigid bronchoscopy as the last resort if you're not able to establish an airway at all. Another thing to consider that helps is turn these patients sideways or in lateral or in prone position so that you can get the, uh, uh, the compression off of the trachea and the vascular structures. We had a patient who became very difficult to ventilate during a lymph node biopsy uh, for anterior median astinal mass. Uh, we had to, uh, he also developed SVC syndrome with facial swelling. We ended up turning him lateral and in semi-prone position, we uh, turned the gas off and uh, the procedure was finished quickly and he was woken up sitting up without any problems. Most childhood cancer can be cured with generic medications and other forms of treatment, including surgery and radiotherapy. However, only 29% of the population in low-income countries has access to cancer medication versus 96% in high-income countries. In this patient, the time from, di uh, from presentation to the healthcare facility to a tissue diagnosis was over two weeks. And you can see how much his uh, anterior mediastinal mass has grown and his risk has increased for anesthesia as well. So diagnosis, delayed diagnosis, and obstacles to access to care are all part of avoidable deaths in low middle income. Chronic infections such as HIV, EB virus, and malaria are also risk factors for childhood cancers. In high income countries, 80% of the children with cancer have a five-year survival rate. In low-middle income countries, less than 30% have a five-year survival rate. So childhood cancer data systems are needed to continuously improve the quality of care that is being uh, provided and also to influence policy. The Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer aims to raise the survival rate for all children to 60% by the year 2030. They hope to provide technical assistance to develop more effective uh, programs for cancer treatment in low middle income countries. The Japanese Cancer Group is, is, so is uh, involved in three uh, global initiatives, uh, hepatoblastoma and hepatocellular carcinoma, relapse pre B cell ALL, and ALL in children with trisomy 21 syndrome. So in conclusion, I would say that as time goes on, we expect to see more and more patients who are cancer uh, survivors and also more cancer patients in itself. Uh, and in, as an anesthesiologist, it is imperative that we understand the unique challenges each one of these patients present to us. I'd be happy to answer any questions in the group discussion after this. Okay, thank you very much for like a comprehensive uh, lectures regarding the anesthesia considerations for pediatric oncology patients. We'll take uh, questions or comments in the round table discussions. Okay, let's move on to the second speaker. Second speaker is uh, Dr. Maria Alejandra Echeto from San Pedro Sula, Honduras. Our topic today is uh, pain management for pediatric oncology patients in a low resource setting. Hello everyone. I hope you're all enjoying and learning a lot from this wonderful webinar. The topic I will be sharing with you today is pain management for pediatric oncology, specially focused on the many challenges low resource settings have to endure. Let me begin with some very worrisome statistics. One big issue for cancer treatment and pain management is that more than two thirds of the world's population and 90% of diagnosed cancers each year live in limited resource settings. And to make it even worse, low income countries and low middle income countries only account for 6.2% of the financial expenditures on cancer. It is believed 
that by the end of this decade, cases of pediatric cancer will increase by 30%. Another big issue is the fact that one of the greatest indicators of cure for cancer is where they live. This is sad, but true. Of the more than 300,000 cases that actually, in the most recent data, is up to 400,000 of cancer cases diagnosed each year, 80% live in low-income and low-middle-income countries. And on that 80%, only 20% get cured. On the other hand, only 20% live in high-income countries. And of those approximately 60,000 cases, 80% get cured. That disparity is very obvious and also very sad. But what about pain? Is it the same for pain? Sadly, it is. In high-income countries, reported prevalence of moderate to severe pain is about 40%. And in most cases, it's tumor or treatment related. In low income and low middle income countries, the prevalence of moderate to severe pain is 70%. And due to limited registries and published data, its related cause is not known, but it is assumed to be tumor related since most cases present with advanced disease on diagnosis. It has been reported that prevalence of pain has been reduced by approximately 10% over the past decade. But this reduction is not significant if we compare it to the 40% of patients that still receive an inadequate treatment. So how do we manage pain? It is important that we first outline some important aspects on pain management in pediatric oncology patients before we list all the challenges faced in low-income countries and middle-income countries. And to address management, we always need to begin with the basics. These are the steps that we have to consider before establishing our treatment or management strategy. First, we need to assess the child and conduct thorough physical examination. We have to determine the primary and the secondary causes of pain. Number two, we need to develop an individualized treatment plan. There is no recipe for all child. We need to individualize every treatment plan and always consult a pain management expert early, if possible, within the first contact. Number three, include pharmacological and integrative treatments. Prevent and treat all adverse events. Number four, implement the plan. And remember, we have to always uh, have into consideration the five uh, World Health Organization recommendations whenever, whenever we, every time we have prescribed uh, a drug, an analgesic, that we have to remember that we always have to take in consideration the most appropriate route. Analgesics should be given at a regular interval, and also we have to establish rescue doses. They should be prescribed according to pain intensity, and dosing should be according and adapted to every child's need, and always with constant concern to detail. And number five, we need to conduct routine evaluations to assess pain and the effects of the treatment given. Change of plan if needed. But how do we decide what pharmacological or non-pharmacological approach is best for the patient? We need to first identify the many causes of pain in an oncology patient. Pain may be associated with diagnostic procedures, with, onco with oncological surgeries, with the treatment itself, and from advancing tumors or metastatic disease. And of course, we need to have very present that pain can be somatic, can be visceral, visceral, can be neuropathic, or a mixture of all the types of pain. Also, we need to identify if it's acute, chronic, or if it's breakthrough pain. After establishing pain characteristics, we also need to remember to assess pain. No pain treatment can be given if we do not assess pain before and continuously throughout the management. Remember there are age appropriate pain assessment scales and we have different types of pain assessment scales. We have self-reporting scales, we have observational scales, and we have physiological sign-based scales. Here we have a nice table that summarizes according to age the scales that can be used. We can also use this acronym QUEST with a double T at the end to remember the steps to assess pain in a child. First, we have to question the child if the child is old enough to self-report or to describe what he is feeling. Use always age-appropriate pain rating scales. Evaluate the child's behavior because sometimes children don't tell us what they feel, but they do express it with their behavior. Secure parents' involvement or the caregiver's involvement. 
take the cost of pain always into account and take the earliest action possible. Another important issue we must not forget is that documenting our assessment results, our observations, and the chosen regimen to favor a correct and easy follow-up of the patient. So once we have identified the cause and the type of pain, and we have also assessed our patient, we proceed to follow a suggested approach to guide our management. This approach was suggested by the World Health Organization since 1986. They suggested the use of a three-step ladder approach to guide the best choice of therapy for patients in pain. The ladder has gone through many modifications and adaptations. One of the latest versions includes a fourth step that provides the option of interventional treatment. It added the need of adjuvants and integrative medicine in all of the steps of the ladder in an attempt of reducing opioid misuse and abuse. Arrows were also added to emphasize on the different approaches for acute with a rapid descent of the ladder and chronic with slowly moving up the steps. The World Health Organization ladder educational value and capability of worldwide dissemination are definitely unquestionable. But some believe that the first step is insufficient for intense pain management or that the ladder is not really good for certain types of pain or for certain types of management. Therefore, a fast track diagram starting directly at step three or a modified two step ladder approach have been proposed. The two step approach is a valuable alternative for cancer pain treatment. This adaptation of the ladder suggests the use of strong opioids in low doses instead of weak opioids. We must remember that the term weak refers to analgesic potency and customary manner in which the drugs are used, but not on the pharmacologic of pure opioid agonism or opioid equivalence. It doesn't mean that this type of opioids are harmless or are safe. Coding and tramadol are both pro-drugs and their metabolism is subject to genetic polymorphisms. Their clinical response is very unpredictable. It has been observed that using this approach, we can achieve the same analgesic effect, less side effects, and much lower costs. So some countries have adapted this two-step approach to simplify management and to save costs. Now, there are some important facts we need to remember when establishing a pain management strategy. Number one is prescribe a treatment plan with the simplest type and regimen of administration and the least invasive method possible. Management of pain on any step includes acetaminophen and or NSAIDs, except if contraindicated, like for example, with primary liver or metastatic disease to the liver, thrombocytopenia. Caution with ketorolac and metamisole in younger than two years of age. Ketorolac may cause gastroduodenopathy and bleeding diastasis. Metamisole or dipirone has been banned from many countries due to the risk of agronocytosis and reports of severe allergic reactions. Few analgesics are FDA approved in children. Off-label use is very common and precaution must be taken when using certain drugs in patients younger than 18 years of age. Tramadol and codeine have an unreliable effect dependent on genetic polymorphisms and severe cases of respiratory depression at normal doses have been reported. Methadone, although it has a good oral bioavail bioavailability, long half-life, and, no and doesn't have an active metabolite. Also, it has an oral liquid formulation that it's super fit for children, and it's also cheap. Some concerns have arisen from its use due to the prolongation of the QTC interval. So, baseline and control ECGs after dose modifications have to be taken and its dosaging in children should be only be done by pain experts. Meperidine has an active metabolite known to cause neurotoxic effects even in patients with correct dosing and no renal impairment. Plus, its analgesic effect can be achieved by using other opioids. As for the acetylsalicylic acid or ASA, in children younger than 12 years, it has been related to RISE syndrome. We have to remember that non-pharmacological treatment strategies must always be used if available without replacing analgesics, but they are always necessary since they provide comfort and well-being for the patient. We need to remember also that morphine is a treatment of choice in cases of moderate to severe pain. Rescue doses for breakthrough pain must be treated with immediate release formulation opioids 
and 10 to 20% of the total 24 hour dose that is given. When withdrawing opioids, you never suspend abruptly. It must be done progressively, more or less 20 to 50% of the original dose withdrawn per week to reduce opioid side effects because almost 77% of patients have at least one side effect, you need to do a dose reduction, change opioids, change the route, and also add symptomatic therapy. Anticonvulsants and antidepressant drugs are usually added when there is neuropathic component of pain. Steroids have beneficial effects on appetite, nausea, mood, and malice. The mechanism of analgesia produced by these drugs especially the steroids speaking, may involve anti-edema effects, anti-inflammatory effects, and direct influence on the electrical activity of damaged nerves. So now that we have in our mind some important aspects of pain management in pediatric oncology, we will now list some of the challenges encountered by low resource settings. Let's start with some financial challenges. Patients are usually too poor to pay for transportation, food or shelter, too expensive or highly restricted assets for pain medication and or treatment because there is very few specialized cancer treatment centers and the very few existing are too expensive because they are usually private and the public ones are only located in main cities. Also malnutrition is over 50% in children in low income countries and this makes them very propense to um, toxicity and adverse events. Infrastructure and government policies have inconsistent availability and an unreliable stock of pain medications. There are very various restrictions for medical use of controlled drugs. There is lack of radiation imaging facilities, few pain, pain or palliative care services available. There is low priority assigned to pain relief. All of this gives us late assessment and early abandonment or neglection of the therapy and high toxicity rates or adverse events with high percentage of children with pain in low middle income countries. What about workforce? Lack of oncology or palliative care specialists and they all and the few that exist have very increased workload. There is a lack of first contact health providers and nurses that have high level of awareness no budget for salaries, training, or even home visits. There is a lack of health care workers that are able to prescribe. There is difficulty for pain assessment in young ages because there is really no knowledge on the different pain scales on the most or the most appropriate ones for children. And usually dosages are extrapolated from adults. The lack and deficiencies of available workforce cause late diagnosis and assessment, increased risk of complications, longer hospital stays, and increased morbidity. Other important obstacles are education and cultural benefits of the population, religious beliefs that cancer will heal from faith, or the lack of complete understanding of cancer and its consequences, the underreport of pain by patients due to the belief that pain is an unavoidable part of the treatment, fear of adverse event, effects, addictions, or other medical consequences if you report pain, the distrustfulness towards medical system and the experience of guilt and depression, all of these uh, cause patients to underreport pain. The research and registries are really bad. There is a lack of accurate registration system, missing reachers, uh, skate holders and advocacy, there is no budget for research, and there's a lack of evidence and funding for research on most treatments. These all cost under diagnosis of cancer and of pain, under recognition of pain by staff, and a lack of accurate data, and unrecognized need of implementing changes. Besides all of the previously mentioned challenges, there are some realities faced at public hospitals in limited resource settings. Usually, public hospitals at low income and low middle income countries do not have pain medicines. There is no availability or an unregular availability of different med medications. Imaging and treatment services available are very few. Usually, publicly, only x rays are available. And the rest of the treatments, if they are available, they are usually only in private sectors and um, or outreach aided. Hospital bed availability is very low and they have a high rotation. That means that they have to dispatch patients very early and they only have very few beds if they have beds for palliative care or for severely ill. 
there is no workforce, very few anesthesiologists. If there is an anesthesiologist, there's only one and maybe only one palliative care specialist. There are no CRNA nurses. So workforce is a very important issue. Anesthetic and equipment available. The existing equipment is usually outdated with no reliable maintenance. And anesthetics, usually the most constant availability is the fentanyl. And usually the others are once in a while you have them, then maybe some other times you don't. And under all of these not so favorable conditions, how do low income and low middle income countries manage pain? We usually adapt the World Health Organization analgesic ladder to whatever we have available, sometimes using off-label medications for children and not following some recommendations for pain management. We use tramadol with a reduction of the dose. Usually we use it at 0.5 milligrams per kilo. We use metamisol because sometimes IV paracetamol is not available or if it's available, it's very expensive. Some countries have banned, as we mentioned earlier, metamisol, but we still use it. Interventional therapies are only available privately and they are very expensive. Various medications are not available on a regular basis, so we use whatever we have in, on our hands and we do the best we can with what we have. But all great changes are preceded by chaos. So this is something a little bit encouraging. Some countries are already working on government policies that follow the WHO palliative care policy and cure all guidelines. Some are working to address drug availability problems, although this requires a lot of work because in the effort to control misuse and abuse of controlled drugs, they become scarce and become unavailable for clinical use. In education, much is being done. A lot of short courses, mentoring, virtual certifications are being sponsored and carried out. And of course, local champions are always the key in the dynamics of changing and always making better adaptations of management protocols for even the most resource limited environments. But what else can we do? What else can each of us contribute with? We need to get everyone involved, more non-governmental organizations, charities, civil societies, volunteers, schools to create and support hospices, shelter, and maybe food for children and families. Education is always the key for everything. We need radio and television ads for public awareness, curriculum incorporation of a palliative care in nursing, medical, uh, general physicians, um, in med school, in everything. We need to innovate and think of incredible ways to make our cancer patients' life easier, more likable, more bearable to the point that maybe they want to come to the appointments. And of course, never cease to call for action within our countries and worldwide. Spread the word of what real numbers are and the impact a little help may have on a child's quality of life. And at last but not least, I want to outline the key elements for implementing initiatives for better cancer care and pain management in any low resource setting. First, we need to identify the problems so we know exactly what needs to be done. Usually local problems have local solutions. Then prioritize and choose one of two problems to establish a realistic action plan. International partnerships and twining, very important to nurture support and maximize its uses. Multidisciplinary teams are very important and probably the key to avoid resistance to change. And always record and register baseline data and the results to be able to evidence all the positive changes. And always, always remember that change will not come if we wait for another person or maybe some other time. We are the ones we have been waiting for and we are the change that we seek. I do not want to finish without giving acknowledgement to Dr. Roxana Martinez, Gloria Mancias, and Lenny Alvarado. They are the pediatric and mat oncologists at my city, and one of them is the only pediatric palliativist in the whole country. So thanks for them because they helped me with the sum of data of the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Maria, for the interesting lecture. I am very impressed the, the uh, there is a big, huge disparities in pediatric uh, oncology care among uh, lower middle income countries. Maybe we may address this issue later in the roundtable discussions.
Okay, let's move on to the third speaker, Dr. Professor Sebo Hotskem from Turkey. Our topic today is uh, procedural sedation for imaging and uh, radiation uh, therapy. Hi, konnichiwa. I'm really honored to be invited to speak at this valuable meeting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Norifimu Kuratani. I hope this collaboration will nourish in the future uh, at varying degrees in numerous fields of pediatric anesthesia. This is the hospital where I work, uh, Ajibadam Atumzade Hospital, one of the leading private health groups in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Eh? Uh, we are lucky that uh, we have a very safe environment in means of non-operating room anesthesia. Uh, as you know, the need for anesthesia service outside the operating theaters has expanded exponentially in the past decade. Few hospitals are constructed with NORA as a priority. Nobody wants to go there. It's usually taken as a burden. So we'll go over uh, procedural sedation for ima imaging and radiation therapy for our ch uh, oncological children now. Uh, in this uh, panel, we try to enlighten some aspects of pro uh, procedural sedation. We uh, overview the indications, different levels of sedation, medication used, uh, how do we prepare the patient, uh, monitoring and documentation requirement, and some potential complications of procedural sedation and their prevention and management strategies. Uh, I think there is no need to overemphasize uh, that procedural sedation is a continuing process. Uh, you begin with minimal sedation. Uh, however, you can end up at general anesthesia, depending on the patient, the comorbidities, the procedure and the environment, and the personnel and your team. So when the word sedation is in the sentence, we should be ready and prepared for general anesthesia as well. And Nora, locations are known to fraught with patient safety concerns and high stress more than the operating theaters. When we talk about procedural sedation for children having oncological care, this is a bit more different. This is called something new, iterative anesthesia. We will discuss why do we have to give repetitive sedation, what are the problems confronted during uh, these uh, sedation and anesthesia procedures, patient-related factors, anesthesia type, equipment and environment problems, and some safety guidelines. Radiotherapy has been used as the primary treatment in childhood, childhood malignancies with surgery and or chemotherapy. Tumors of the pediatric age group like nephroblastoma, neuroblastoma, osteosarcoma, ependymoma, medulloblastoma, craniopharyngioma, gaminoma, and primitive neuro neuroectodermic tumors are preferred to be treated by chemo and radiotherapy sequences, and during these treatments, frequent MRI controls are also needed. By maintaining healthy tissue during radiotherapy, it's imperative to provide immobilization to achieve a more accurate radiation dose distribution at the target volume. So the children on oncological care need sedation and or anesthesia during their diagnostic imaging, uh, some uh, imaging for planning, some painful procedures like bone marrow aspiration, lumbar puncture, or intraticle injections, and their surgeries, and also for the radiotherapy sequences. We have a patient and his family. They are all uh, very fragile, very tiny patients we have who had undergone. Uh, who had recently undergone a major surgery and just recovering from the pain of it, infection may be a problem, wound healing, and some he may have some neurological deficits like posteriposa syndrome or insufficient airway protection and maybe cerebral palsy or convulsions. And also they are all psychologically fragile. Anxiety, both parental and the patient, is a, pro a problem also. Possible simultaneous chemotherapy 
they may have some side effects. Hematological deficiencies like anemia, thrombocytopenia, and infections may occlude the way. Nausea, vomiting, insufficient food bake, nutritional instability, frequent, almost everyday fasting are the problems we face. As you know, radiotherapy is applied uh, by a source of external beam, by protons or fo for photons, uh, and by bracket therapy, which is applied from a short distance for ret retinoblastoma or sarcomas. Uh, planning is necessary with simulation for MRI, CT, and PET scan, so these children have to be sedated during these procedures as well. There are lots of side effects of radiotherapy. Uh, in the short term, we may have emotional tiredness, uh, nausea and vomiting, uh, taste and changes, diarrhea, loss of hair, headache, blurred vision, skin changes, and radiation burns and mucositis. In the long term, the child may have claustrophobia, regression in behaviors, tissue wounds, hormonal changes, fertility changes, abnormal growing, neurocognitive deficits, urinary and bladder changes, secondary malignancies, or complications like vascular and cardiac diseases. By maintaining a healthy tissue during radiotherapy, it's imperative to provide immobilization to achieve uh, the accurate radiation dose distribution at the target volume. These children are especially aged between zero to five. General anesthesia and sedation is necessary to achieve this immobilization. Uh, these children has to have repeated anesthesia up to six weeks every day, coming fasting, fought with alien devices around. They have to stay in a closed area for 10 to 14 minutes. And because of the high energy radiation applied, the patient must be alone during the treatment. Parents, they are all anxious about the procedure and the disease itself and the future. And we are also far from the anesthesia team who are at the operating theaters. The goal of the sedation uh, is to decrease the potential systemic and neurological toxicity. However, the risks of anesthesia and sedation are increased in these remote places. Techniques ha uh, has to be applied to prevent the harmful consequences. Timing is a pro uh, problem. There are tight schedules in the radiotherapy units, and we have to consider the sedation and general anesthesia durations during appointment uh, arrangements. The infrastructure in the radiotherapy units is a problem. They should be in concordance with the uh, RT unit and safe anesthesia requirements. Uh, the anesthesia team should be ready at all, at all means, capable of managing every clinical and non-clinical crisis. Uh, the, uh, there are position constraints required by the practitioner in children with planned RT procedures and the restrictions on airway manipulation due to patient special, like patient specific facial masks are used uh, for the treatment of head and neck tumors. And these uh, may occlude our access to the airway uh, and the uh, measurement of these face masks should be uh, made taking in consideration the airway or the LMA place, so you should have the measurement when, uh, with your airway devices. Monitors should be charged enough to be able to work in these distant places. And the, the, um, we don't forget that we have a difficulty in accessing the patient. The problems arise, arising from the patient's primary diagnosis and chemotherapy require careful preparation and attention. Uh, there are stab stabilization tools used throughout the body to prevent movement and falling of the children during treatment. Um, there may be some side effects of the concurrent chemotherapy, comorbidity caused by the tumor or surgery, as well as the side effects of radiotherapy. The location of the RT units is usually far from the operating traitors, some distant parts of the hospitals or the radiotherapy is a separate place uh, on his own. So we may have shortage of equipment, personnel, and monitors. Uh, we it is necessary to monitor the patients with closed monitoring systems. And usually the anesthetist and the anesthesia team is the only physician the parents are seeing. And regarding all these, publications are very limited. 
To ensure the safety and efficacy of sedation, the patient is monitored by a camera system in a closed area. This can cause difficulties in the, in the dose titration of the anesthetic agents since we are far away, the pa away from the patient. Uh, as I said, the uh, radiotherapy units are far from the rest of the hospital or the PICU, so we have to transfer the patient after the uh, procedure to those units. Also, we are applying sedation or anesthesia, and we have, uh, our, or our drugs have their own complications. Apnea, desaturation, airway obstruction, cough, aspiration of secretions are the most common complications we encounter. Bradycardia, tachycardia, hypotension, hypertension, tachyphlaxis, tolerance, uh, intolerance, agitation are all uh, confronted. The, uh, the vascular complications are the nightmares. Port malfunctions, IV access difficulties are very difficult for us, for the family and for the child himself. Uh, we have to evaluate the, uh, our patients before the procedure. Uh, proper fasting guidelines should be applied informed consent with a detailed description to the parents how the sedation and procedure will be carried on should be given to the patients and the uh, patients in their um, understanding uh, level and to the parents every child has a ritual, a ritual so we have to obey these rituals of these children monitorization pre procedure pre Peri procedure as appropriate should be applied at all times. Every clinic has their own recipes or formulas for sedation, uh, but these different sedation and general anesthesia techniques are depending on the patient, infrastructure, and equipment you have. Uh, like some techniques, uh, transmucosal sedation can be applied intranasal, lingual, or rectal, depending on the child. However, these have unpredictable effectiveness. Oral sedation for, uh, with chloral hydrate is out of date, off label, and dangerous and should not be used. Parenteral access is inevitable in these children. Uh, we have to have ports or long term, long term lines. However, um, if we don't have these, the IV access will be a problem. Uh, Midazolam. Uh, is a choice. Dexmedotomidin is inspiring and hopeful with minimum cerebral effects. Ketamine has uncontrollable, um, has, uh, is causing some uncontrollable movements and ex excess secretions at the airway and some psychiatric complications and tachyphylaxis. Unpleasant psychological experiences, double vision, longer recovery, uh, high incidence of nausea and vomiting is the problems of uh, using ketamine. The usually preferred technique is low dose propofol, um, titrated to effect and very slow infusion. If there's pain, you can use remifentanil, fentanyl also. Uh, but the low dose propofol is the most used TIVA technique uh, in most of the RT units. Uh, we have to have qualified, efficient venous lines, catheter, central liquid world, as I said, portacat, roviac, or peak lines are the standards. Uh, however, the complications of these lines is the infection, so we have to be very careful about the disinfecting uh, techniques during uh, giving our the administration of the drugs. Uh, alternatively, peripheral lines can be used, but these should be changed at every two days, and this is very difficult in small children. This causes pain, anxiety, and fear. Uh, even we use local anesthetic creams. Uh, we, sometimes we have to uh, sedate the child with nitrous oxide, putting IV with uh, inhalation anesthesia. Airway safety should be maintained at all times. Inhalational anesthesia is uh, a choice, uh, 
but we need anesthesia machine, vaporizers, and breathing systems, filters, gas scavenging systems, airway safety devices, and le like laryngeal mask airways are very useful in this uh, scenario. Uh, some children may wake up with uncontrollable hyperactive movements, and additional anesthesia may be necessary for them in the post-operative uh, recovery place. Uh, when you use inhalation anesthesia, sometimes IV is not necessary uh, if the child uh, is a very experienced and had, gone under, had undergone many, many therapies. We can combine general anesthesia and sedation. I would begin with IV induction uh, in children with anxiety and fear from the face mask or has insufficient protective airway reflexes and maintenance with laryngeal mask airway after inhalation anesthesia and quick recovery may be obtained. So you can choose your uh, formula or recipe or technique of uh, sedation uh, according to the needs of the patient, equipment and infrastructure of the uh, environment you have, and this defines the anesthetic protocol. Uh, Intranasal dexmethodomidine uh, versus oral medazolam and ketamine has been uh, studied and it found to be uh, very effective, but uh, we studies are still needed about that. Uh, our friends had uh, made a study with propofol-based and uh, balanced anesthesia, and they had concluded that the balanced anesthesia with propofol was safe. Uh, sedation, rapid awakening, and rapid discharge without side effects uh, in radiotherapy units. Gabapentin has been uh, tried in oncological patients. And uh, ketamine, uh, as, as it's known as the battlefield anesthetic, and this is a battlefield as well. Uh, but the advantage of uh, ketamine uh, is that you can keep the airway reflexes intact and the hemodynamically stable. Uh, provides a safety zone for sedated but spontaneously ventilated patients, especially at remote places like RT units. However, there is a disagreement about whether it gives continuous and steady level of sedation during repeated RT sedations sessions, or um, it may have a tendency to tolerance uh, occurrence to ketamine. Uh, this has been claimed, however, when used repetitive and NDA receptor antagonists are stated to be tolerance preventive, so most of these are uh, to be done. So, rather than the recipes of the general anesthesia or sedation, we need a, a properly educated team. There should be consensus statements and applies international standards and guidelines. Every day, the invasiveness of the care should be discussed with the multidisciplinary team. Uh, shall we intubate the uh, child every day or IV access every day? So we have to discuss these. Defining the incidence of complication rates in the RT units is necessary. The effects of anesthetics other than dexmethodomidine in the mature growing brain should be studied. The neurodegenerative and emotional effect of iterative anesthesia uh, should be kept in mind. So sedation needs sufficient equipment, IV is necessary, and motorization uh, is a must. The care of children treated in RT and chemotherapy centers have specific and very special and have very special difficulties. Very and very few studies and scientific consensus has in this field. Uh, in the RT units, we have to keep the minimum safety requirements. Uh, anesthetists should ask for the minimum necessary equipment and infrastructure when general anesthesia and sedation of these children is provided. The centers should meet the standards equal to the operating rooms and suggestions for international standard requirements. At least there should be one spare room for anesthesia or people with sufficient equi equipment capable of providing anesthesia big and acute enough. Uh, we need air or oxygen aspiration systems, uh, monitorization equipment, chargeable and mobile monitors, all necessary drugs with sterile port needles, proper disinfection material, and special venous e access equipment should be ready. 
we have to have CPR equipment, protocols for transport of critical children to the related fetal or oncological clinics uh, has to be made and the necessary agreements should be there. RT personnel should be trained to help the anesthesia team approach to the experienced, very experienced patient uh, and the IV access and safety of airway and breathing are utmost important. Video monitoring of the patients is mandatory as well. We can elaborate the RT units like this, but um, there is nothing important as uh, this uh, gentleman who carries the child and the child sees this, uh, their brother every day, uh, he is very valuable. So in the uh, RT units, care for the complex psychological status of the oncological child and the family is very important. We do not have to, for we do not forget that the anesthesia team is the only team that the family and child is meeting every day for six weeks. Care for the riches of the child uh, is very important. We have to try to obey them uh, so that we can keep the child's anxiety at minimum. Minimally, we can use, uh, we, we should use minimally invasive manipulations. Uh, keep in mind that laryngeal mask airways are safe and life saving in times of crisis. So, as a conclusion, iterative anesthesia is less known, underestimated, neglected, taken as easy, yet time consuming, difficult, and needs well experienced team approach to pediatric and service subgroups. Techniques and protocols change at every center and regulations does not exist. To decrease adverse effects, the quality of infrastructure and equipment, education and experience of the team should be increased. Animation, plays, rituals for every patient is necessary to apply the daily, daily appropriate uh, appliance to decrease the psychological and physical effects, side effects. Domo arigato for listening to me uh, and keeping your time. Uh, and I want to invite you to the to, to 20th meeting of Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesia, which will be held in uh, July in Kuching, Malaysia. Thank you. Hi. Uh, now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Mr. Lucas Opitz, who is a distinguished medical professional with a dual role as the head of the pediatric anesthesia at Saint Antoine La Cassayam and the neonatologist uh, at University Hospital Nice uh, in France. With an impressive background in anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, and the neonatology, Dr. Opitz has made significant contributions to the in the field of anesthesiology. He is recognized for pioneering the concept of iterative anesthesia, a novel approach that has the potential to change the way we uh, give anesthesia to our pediatric patients. His innovative idea, ideas and dedication to improving the care of children undergoing anesthesia procedures has gained him international recognition. His lecture will be a valuable contribution and the floor is yours, Dr. Lucas. Dear colleagues from all over the world, thank you so much for inviting me to this webinar. Thank you for, to Dr. Kuratani uh, for organizing this uh, webconf on uh, anesthesia and cancer care of, of, for the behalf, on behalf of uh, WFSA. Um, I don't have any conflict of interest and my name is Lucas and I'm a neonatologist and pediatric anesthesiologist and I've been asked to work uh, eight years ago while well, to start to implement a center of uh, anesthesia for children in a proton therapy center in Nice, which was a very interesting experience and I want to share this experience with you. As an anesthesiologist for children and neonatologist, I'm very sensitive to the fragility of children we care for, be it in NICU and or in um, oncological center. And I'm asking you, what do these children have in common? What does this 27 weaker of, uh, of 700 grams in our NICU in common with this 7.2 kilo, uh, not even one year old baby with a nephroblastoma? 
Yes, they are very fragile and they are fragile for a very long time. They are high risk patients and we as anesthesiologists have always this uh, need, this understandable need to be mastering the risks and um, therefore we need monitoring and of course with monitoring we get more and more invasive and therefore also we expose these children to some iatrogenic risk. So my question is what is the right dosage of invasiveness in these fragile oncological children? These children are fragile because they are young. They are below five years, very often below three years, sometimes below one year of age. And we have to give them anesthesia every day in a repeated way during three, four, five, six weeks or even more, 33 sessions. They have undergone surgery, so sometimes we need to take care of this surgical or post-surgical aspects. They are not always, but sometimes under chemotherapy with all the side effects. They have uh, nutritional issues because oncological patients are nutritionally uh, fragile, but they are especially in this context with chemotherapy and with our fasting that we impose to these children four to six hours before on our anesthesia. Very often we have uh, uh, children that are nauseous, that sometimes do vomit. We have children that have an impact on um, their hematological system with immunosuppression, with anemia, thrombocytopenia. We have to deal with this. And very often these children are extremely fragile just globally and they are asthenic. They have very often, especially of course, our um, patients uh, we treat for cerebral tumors, neurological signs we have to deal with. And they have, especially for those who we treat for ear, nose, throat tumors, mucositis, swelling of the cavum, which has an impact on the airways and on secretions we have to take care for. So the question again is how do we deal with this? May we delay a start of radiation therapy? Or is it a lack of chance if we did so? Or may we interrupt a treatment if a child is especially weak for a certain period? Uh, or what is the impact on the outcome of radiation therapy? So we have been trying to discuss this um, together with our colleagues and uh, I've been trying to promote some meetings and uh, to speak at certain conferences also in association with the International uh, Society of Pediatric Oncologists and uh, the aim was to create a network on this and it seems that this network might uh, be built up thanks to SIOP Europe. Um, anyway, we uh, started to doing some activities and and we started our activities with a first survey, which I want to uh, share with you the results that the results that on certain questions, one of the questions was where our radiation therapy trip departments were located and we could see that they are very far from pediatric hospitals in the majority of the cases, which means that there is no safety net. Infrastructures were not sufficient. In many cases, up to 25% had no remote control. More than the half of the people interviewed did not have an induction room and about 30% did not have a recovery room. It also became clear that um, many colleagues, up to 30%, uh, do not have a specific pediatric um, activity in their daily life and that they um, treat children in less than 10% of the cases. This little experience uh, in pediatrics is true as well globally in radiation centers. Um, up to 15% of the radiation centers we interviewed had less than 10 patients a year under general anesthesia. We asked also some descriptive questions and had 
uh, these answers on the biggest concerns in pediatric anesthesia in radiation centers. And as you probably all can understand, respiratory issues were number one. But in general, very often, uh, the, ex we ex the expression of a lacking uh, of uh, safety issues, lacking of experienced staff, and uh, the lack of equipment as well was very often expressed. Um, respiratory problems is always number one. I think we all agree on that. We always have this uh, little thing in our m mind, even if we are experienced pediatric anesthesiologists. Broncholaryngospasm is something we really uh, want to avoid. Um, in specifically in radiation centers, um, very often our colleagues answered about uh, a concern which was the one of ha having non-sufficient sedation with movement uh, and even a child that fell off the table. So I want to ask you, um, well, how risky is our uh, work in radiation centers in general in pediatrics? We say that it is a more risky matter than uh, if when we treat uh, healthy young adults, of course. <laughs> uh, and this, you know, probably about this um, survey, uh, which is called Abricot, that has been done in 33 countries in Europe, uh, concerning the severe critical events and uh, perioperatively there have been up to 5.2 uh, problematic issues that have been observed. Uh, interestingly, um, in certain countries there were some statistically different uh, results um, especially uh, uh, regarding laryngospasm and it seems that Scandinavian countries had much better scores in uh, this um, critical events. Um, my question is also how do we define these critical events? Is it uh, something that is really objective or is it also more an emotional thing because uh, uh, what is a normal uh, event for the one might be a very critical one for the other and this is where expertise maybe has to uh, play its role. The same study um, pointed out that experience is an important factor for safety and uh, the more you are experienced the less you have critical respiratory events and uh, they actually put it in a mathematical way that that every year of experience you get 1% less critical respiratory events. It's an interesting um, information. We also should adapt in our, adopt in our radiation centers. Food and Drug Administration of America stated that repeated anesthesia is a probably um, negative has a negative impact on child children's development and therefore they recommend not to use anesthesia in children unless it was really necessary i think we in our centers with children having tumors surgery chemotherapy plus anesthesia this kind of problem about this concern about the impact of anesthesia on long term is uh, should not be um, should not take too much place in our thoughts, especially if you consider that there is no real statistical evidence on this. So allow me to give you some hints, some hints about these problematic uh, issues we were discussing at the beginning about the young age. I think experience, expertise is important to face uh, in a uh, serene way all the risk factors of young children. The fact that we do anesthesia every day for such a long time means that we 
have to use minimal handling and I'm willing to discuss this with you later. What is minimal handling? But this concept, which has been implemented now more than 20 years ago in neonatology, has a huge uh, impact on the outcome of the newborns in terms of uh, morbidity. In terms of uh, the surgical context, we can use and we can take advantage out of anesthesia with wound treatment during anesthesia. We, have, we are the one to deal with pain in these contexts. We have to prescribe the painkillers. We have to also to organize sometimes the chemotherapy and to organize it uh, in order to make it compatible with our activities in radiation centers. And therefore, I, my hint would be that uh, it is important to have um, chemotherapy during weekends, if that is feasible. Regarding uh, vomiting, well, the stomachs have to be empty and this um, recommendations of uh, using six hours of fasting plus two hours for um, a clear liquid should still be uh, 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 used on in our basis, even though some scientific uh, publications showed that four hours for food would be enough. But in the oncological con context, for me, this is, well, still uh, relatively uh, tricky, but I'm willing to, to learn more about it. Uh, nutrition, very important, as we said before, it is important that we can have, a, uh, we can use anesthetics that are on, off, that means that the children wake up fast and that right after their awakening, they are allowed to eat. Very typically, our children, once they wake up, the first thing they do is being fed, being breastfed or uh, having their uh, bottle of milk or other any other food they want. Um, if that is not enough and if we see that there is a, a loss of weight, we can implement uh, nocturnal feeding through gastro, uh, gastric uh, sond, with the gastric sond. Gastrostomy is very rarely needed. Um, we need monitoring for the immunosuppression. We need to have a very, very careful approach and sterile approach to the central catheters. Uh, we have to deal with uh, um, transfusion of blood, uh, red blood cells or platelets in these contexts. And regarding asthenia, which is very frequent in these cases, we should be always be objective and not let ourselves be impressed by these children that seem to be so tired. Uh, we need objective vital signs to be in order to say this child is not fit for anesthesia because uh, the benefit of going through this radiation therapy is so much higher than the risks uh, which are spontaneous, momentaneous anesthesiologically. And uh, therefore, uh, we should always have a positive approach and even go beyond recommendations saying that uh, anesthesia should not be performed in, in this and that case, especially also for children who have some let's say, minor respiratory problems. Regarding ear, nose, throat patients who have mucositis, also in the context with chemotherapy, uh, the swelling of cavum and uh, uh, cyanorrhea, I really would, would like to recommend you the use of laryngeal masks, which really allows us to uh, perform uh, ventilation and maintenance of anesthesia in uh, safe monitoring conditions with understanding exactly what is happening in terms of um, tidal volume and, and uh, monitoring of anesthesiological gases if they are being used. So uh, the question we will maybe discuss later is uh, should we always use intravenous lines? My answer would be not always and should we have some lines uh, as a rescue system? I would say most of the time, yes, but not always. But we can uh, also discuss what kind of line would be uh, 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 useful. 
Yes, I know I'm a little bit obsessive about laryngeal mask, but it's really very helpful in your radiation centers. Look at the left, you see this child that has an irradiation of uh, ear, nose, throat. Uh, it had a tumor of the cavum, there were hemorrhage uh, in, the, in the airways with, uh, with, uh, hyper, with sialorrhea and laryngeal mask just bypass that very easily. On the right, you can just see that there are the landmarks of the, between the nostrils and the laryngeal mask. So you can really position the baby in a comfortable way and losing, uh, not losing too much time for the positioning. Regarding airways, this is all what we can say in pediatrics is don't do things halfway. Throw yourself into the water, don't handle airways if the baby is not uh, perfectly deeply asleep. So iatrogenics include many aspects and we should not forget the thermal homeostasis, uh, the psychological discomfort and the akathisia which means that the child would uh, at its, its awakening be extremely agitated, irritated and in an in-between state that is very very badly accepted by the child itself of course but by the parents as well and by ourselves because it is not satisfying. So in order to wrap up our presentation yes we can say that the conditions of safety are not always met in our radiation centers and we have to do something about this and uh, the question is do we ha need a special license for treating these very young patients and I want to come back to neonatology. Since regionalization has been introduced in many, many countries, we can see that um, the morbidity and mortality in neonatology has dropped dramatically. And I think the same could be true, not in terms of mortality, because I don't speak about death in radiation centers, but about risk factors in radiation centers. But we can, in a certain way, implement this regionalization, or we can think about it and try to have some referral centers to which children will be sent, uh, especially those children who need general anesthesia in this uh, context. So as I said before, in order to discuss all this, we have this multidisciplinary network that is being um, constructed, let's say, there will be workers, working groups, there will be four subgroups, and we try to use the Delphi process in order to give, give re recommendations that can be useful for our colleagues. Uh, so we need moderators and we need experts and I want you to ask if you are interested, please contact me because we, we, we need a, a, a keen uh, enthusiastic people who, to work on this. So I think we, we are about to say that the times for improvising are over. We should really try to get clearer ideas on what is acceptable, what is, should be done in radiation centers and therefore uh, these working groups, these subgroups could help and I want to, well again, to invite all people who want to join to do so. You can get me very easily through this email address and I want to thank you uh, for your attention and um, uh, well, I'm very keen on uh, the discussions which will follow to my presentation. Thank you so much. And here you can see an induction of a child with in the arms of the mother in our proton center. Thank you so much. Esteemed participants, audience and distinguished speakers, we now welcome you uh, to the discussion part of our webinar. Today, we gather to delve into the topic of uh, importance anesthesia and cancer care in pediatrics. Uh, the knowledge and insights shared here today uh, and they hold the potential to transform we, the way we care for our youngest fa patients facing the challenges of cancer treatment. The intersection of anesthesia and pediatric oncology is a critical area uh, where innovation and collaboration can make a profound impact in the lives of our young patients. 
We are fortunate to have a panel of experts who have contributed their expertise to this discussion. Uh, before we dive into the heart of our agenda, I kindly request each of our distinguished speakers to provide a brief self-introduction. Uh, this will help us to get to know each other better and get the uh, set the stage for the productive and insightful uh, discussion. Let's begin uh, by hearing from our esteemed speakers, starting with Dr. Sadeh Asaf. Thank you for contributions. Thank you, uh, Sir Paul. So I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist and uh, I've been working in pediatric anesthesia since 2004. I have been working in, I work in the United States and came back to Pakistan in 2009. I'm originally from Pakistan uh, and I've, I have this divided practice where I spend half the year working at an academic center in the United States and I spend half the year uh, at a tertiary care public hospital in Pakistan. So I do have uh, some of the challenges that Maria was talking about. And um, I think no matter where all children with cancer and their families are very traumatized by their diagnosis and the treatment itself and its side effects um, are something that traumatizes them every day. So I'm um, really grateful for this group because these patients are increasing in number and we need to address how we can support them better than what we're, how we're doing it at the moment. We can continue with uh, Dr. Maria. Hello everyone. My name is Maria Alejandra Echeto and I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist. I am from Honduras. I live in San Pedro Sula, Honduras. It is not the capital city, but it is the second most important city in the country. Uh, I've been doing pediatric anesthesiology since 2014, more or less, uh, as a pediatric anesthesiologist. And um, I know part of both worlds. Uh, in Honduras, we have the public sector, which is like you saw, uh, uh, very scarce in, in every way, drugs, equipment, et cetera. So I know that horrible part of the job, but I also know the other part, which is the private sector. Um, in the private sector, we have a whole different world. We, we have everything available and it's very, the disparity is very obvious and we need to do something about that. And I wish um, all of us, uh, the ones that we ha can have ideas and do something about it, we can chair and uh, start implementing new strategies to fight this. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, and we have Dr. Uh, Lucas also. In our discussion part. Yes, hello. Uh, so as I said in my introduction, my name is Lucas. And uh, well, I feel a bit old because uh, I've been doing pediatric anesthesia since 1990. So anyway, <laughs> uh, yes, I'm an anesthesiologist for children. And also I work a lot in intensive care units, be it PICU, but mainly also NICU. And um, I'm very sensitive to both worlds because you both, both expressed uh, the knowledge about high, uh, let's say, high specialized uh, with well-equipped um, environments and those of low-income countries. And me, myself, I've been working a lot also in, uh, let's say, more difficult countries, be it in Africa or in um, Eastern Europe. And uh, so I'm very sensitive and open also in uh, to, to, let's say, to discuss our matters in an adapted way because, of course, those standards we want to give that our high level standards cannot be uh, applied everywhere. And we always have to make compromises with the reality. And so, so this discussion can be really very, very interesting. And we have uh, Dr. Zozoya, uh, Jin Zoe. Hi, Dr. Zozoya. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Tote. I'm pediatric anesthetist from Mongolia. Now I'm living in Sydney. I'm doing my research at University of Sydney. So 
before all, thank you so much for Dr. Kuratani who organizing this interesting webinar. And I am so enjoyed all the speaker's speech. It was really interesting. And I believe that it's uh, uh, really helpful for all anesthesiologists all around the world because this uh, onco-anesthesia and pediatric anesthesia field is always the struggling and challenging field for every pediatric anesthesiologist. So I believe that this webinar is very useful for uh, us. Yeah, thanks, Dolo and Dolze and I, uh, long friends. And he used to do, be a staff anesthesiologist at the uh, Maternal and the Children's Hospital at Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. And he has been involved to uh, pediatric uh, cancer care in his uh, home country. So thank you very much for joining us. And could you tell us or like um, have any questions or comments to the speakers? So the firstly, I really want to ask the do Dr. Serpil. So um, what do you recommend the, the sedation level and outside the operating room? Because it's always the struggling, uh, especially without any specific anesthesia machine. You are muted. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Didn't realize that. Thank you. Thank um, you. Outside the operating room, it depends on what. Uh, what kind of services you're providing? I think if you're in the MRI. A service in the CT scan, it's a different kind of service. Radiation uh, suite is a very different place. Uh, I think the radiation suite are, is uh, a propofol infusion, but if you are in a uh, low resource, resource place with limited monitoring, uh, maybe consider Presidex to look at your patient carefully. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, dexmedetomidine can be more expensive uh, to per in low middle income countries. You can multi dose from a single vial, which helps, or mix it up with a very low dose ketamine, like 0.2 milligrams per kilo of ketamine and some midazolam, and that also helps. I'd be curious to know what Maria thinks of that. Yes, usually that's what we do. We combine ketamine at very low dose with uh, propofol. So it's uh, like a ketofol thing. Uh, it, the best thing is to have them both separate, but sometimes even that is difficult and you have to mix them in one syringe because of the trying to use uh, the less enzymes as possible. But the best thing is to separate both uh, because if you want to add more propofol, then you do not add more ketamine to the, you know, to the mixture. But yes, we usually do that. Uh, privately, we do use DEX uh, because um, now there's some generic um, presentations and it's a lot cheaper now, but still it's only used in the private sector, but not publicly, it's not available. Yeah, in Japan, uh, the uh, pediatric NOLA, Non-operating room anesthesia is one of the hot topics in pediatric anesthesia. Um, the uh, My Children's Hospital is the uh, one of the leading top children's hospital for the cancer care. We take care of a lot of the uh, cancer patients in a hospital. We, actually, we do a CAR-T, one of the only a few institutions which can do a CAR-T therapy in our country. But the uh, most... Uh, uh, non-operating loop sedations are done by a pediatrician and uh, probably the uh, coral hydrates are the most commonly prescribed sedatives when they need the MRI still. And so I think the anesthesiologist should be involved more for the uh, non-operating room uh, anesthesia, but we need more anesthetists. That's the problem. So what, I'm oh, sorry. 
Yes, Mr. Zozo. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question about the catapult, the Maria? So what what about the mixture of the catapult? I mean, the proportion in the mixture in one side range. Could you please tell more about that? Yes, you usually calculate the dose uh, per milligram per kilo of the child for about an hour. And uh, you, you know, if you have, I, I don't know, a 30, uh, kilo uh, child, then you go 0.2 for ketamine and you go like two for um, propofol and you place what it's supposed to um, go for one hour in the same syringe. Like I said, I do not like that um, method. I usually like to separate because if I want to add more propofol, then I do not add at the same time more dose of ketamine. So uh, I do like to separate them, but that's what we usually do. We prepare it uh, according to the milligrams per kilo, and we usually calculate for the time that's going to take the, the procedure approximately, usually 45. In our M MRI, for example, 45 or one hour, 45 minutes or one hour. I also what don't like them up. I like to give my ketamine separately. And actually, as a part of my pre-medication, I don't know why, but the children in Pakistan, when we give them IV midazolam, have, a, uh, have, have an adverse reaction and actually get more anxious with it. So uh, what we discovered is, is that if we add a very low dose ketamine, like 0.1 to 0.2 grams per kilo, along with the low dose of midazolam, to separate from the parents, that helps. Give it a few minutes, it kicks in, then you can separate from the parents go in and then you can add propofol very slowly, keep them breathing. So maybe 0.5, it really depends on the kid. Some children like Lucas talked about are very, very fragile. One milligram per kilo is gonna really knock them out. Uh, some kids are gonna come back over and over again. Well, one milligram per kilo, they just laugh at you. You won't even see any effect. Um, so it's, uh, I kind of try to uh, look at their previous record, see how much they've used, how they reacted to that dose and then adjust your dose, maybe start a little bit slow because you can always have the option of adding more. Yes, I think there is the one key word which would be adaptability. We have to adapt and I think uh, we have to adapt to our environment and we have to adapt to with whom we work and we have to adapt to the child and to the parents. So all this makes a mixture, which makes it so difficult to give you recipes actually. And therefore you can, you can actually almost invent anything. What is important is that in the end is the comfort for the child and the safety for the child and your own comfort. Because if you do something and you feel stressed with this, then well, in a certain way you will have to, to maybe to change it or to feel more comfortable. So uh, any technique which you don't really, uh, you're not really used to, uh, makes you feel uncomfortable. And uh, I think the risk factors will in, uh, increase a lot when you yourself do not feel uh, comfortable. So um, I, uh, yeah, I will, I will, that's why I always spoke about this um, laryngeal mask. I, I know it's a kind of uh, obsession, as I told you, but I think it really gives you a lot of safety because you will really understand what happens to the child because uh, in sedation or the child is not well enough sedated and it, it's moving exactly in the, in the wrong moment when the MRI is, uh, has a sequence and has to be repeated. And so you will repeat the exam once more and it will take another 20 minutes or you give him too much sedative and the child will just stop breathing and in, in, in you're in apnea and you don't know, you have to rush, you have to give him oxygen. You have, so there are different ways to handle this, of, uh, apart from laryngeal mask, which will help you a lot, which of course needs a very a deep anesthesia. But if you use propofol or a halogenic, uh, the awakening will be relatively fast as well. And I don't think it has an, uh, an impact on the after the aftermates. Uh, but uh, we did not speak about uh, one other device, which is very useful and is not very costly, which is the high flow uh, um, oxygen. So uh, if we have, if you have these devices and also in, in low income countries, I think they're not very costly and we can uh, 
give uh, a, a, a very satisfying oxygenation to children, even if they are in almost very hypoventilating or even in apnea. So this high uh, uh, or very high flow devices are very, very uh, useful. They, I don't know about if you know how uh, important they have become in our intensive care settings. And uh, we very often ventilate well. Uh, newborns with very high flow with like uh, two liters uh, or even three liters a kilo per minute of uh, of very often normal air, normal 21% uh, um, of oxygen, but it really improves a lot the respiratory conditions. And I think in these settings, it could be helpful. Okay, thanks. And uh, actually, unfortunately, time is running short, but before we finish, uh, I would like to ask uh, one question to all the speakers. Uh, this webinar is hosted by WFSA, and uh, the, the, our one of the, our mission is like uh, delivering uh, high quality anesthesia care for everyone, everywhere in the world. And uh, in this webinar, we, we engaged uh, speakers all around the world, and we learned that there is a big unacceptable disparities in pediatric cancer care among the countries. And my question is, how can we address, how can we fix the uh, disparities, inequalities? So maybe Lucas, you are working in a, like a most advanced uh, research rich environment and uh, do you have any suggestions or how can we help to Maria for? It's very difficult, I think, because uh, we need people, we need money and we need right. uh, adapted politics. Look at the world, how the world is actually, look at the the war, wars we have all over the, which are we we spend money, uh, uh, billions of dollars for killing each other, and but we don't have the money for just uh, taking care of our children. I think it would not be so very very expensive, but we need a political will. So <laughs> there are so many things I could tell you, but I mean we need four hours speaking now. I don't think this is the proposed, but I, I think this is a very important uh, discussion. Very, very important, yes. And we really okay. should think about this. Thanks. Saida, you are working on like, uh, both ends. So, yeah, so any ideas? Sorry, were you Maria? Hmm? No, Saida. Oh, Saida? Then, huh? then, then I... Zaida, you have any questions? Yeah. I don't know any comments. You are working the two ends, America and Pakistan. So St. Jude's and WHO have started this, uh, this collaboration. And the hospital where I work at in Pakistan is a part of this collaboration. And as a, as a part of it, they're taking the pediatric oncologists, offering them um, training periods in the United States, and uh, for, for example, the neurosurgeon from Pakistan right now is visiting St. Jude's to see how they uh, uh, for uh, children there. And so, th so there is this collaboration and transfer of knowledge and transfer of skills that is taking. I think that's very important. As people come back, they get exposed to different environments. So, so you asked, do I think the most important thing is, is offer physicians and healthcare providers in low and middle income countries exposure and train them better. So go back and work in their own environment and, the, and then they are able to identify the gaps themselves and they can come up with their own local solutions on how to approach their problem. Yes, I Sorry, I sorry, Maria. I agree with Sadia. I think education is the first step to take. Number one, maybe uh, WSFSA has a EPM program, but um, it's directed to uh, any kind of pain. Maybe if we could do an EPM for cancer pain, specifically for pediatrics, like for example, directed to nurses, general physicians, pediatricians, uh, not only anesthesiologists, that would be one thing. Another one would be uh, scholarships for um, our resident. We have a resident 
program uh, here in Honduras, and maybe uh, one of them is interested in pain and palliative care uh, and to rotate where um, uh, Dr. Um, Lucas has his, uh, you know, very high end and uh, technology and they could see all that or they can be trained in pain specialty and then they come back here and they want to do a department. We do not have a pain service in the public hospitals. There's no pain service. So uh, it would be interesting to have them go study um, that and or even have uh, virtual uh, classes with you guys with specialty uh, in specialties in palliative service and pain service. Um, the, that would be very nourishing. So education first. And then when we have a group, a, a very good uh, um, workforce that knows a lot and knows the importance of this, they can address it together. We can do many things. So I would start from education. Okay, thanks. If, hmm? if, if I may add, I think we have to also address palliative care. More than 70 to 80% of these children in, in resource poor settings are not going to be cured. Mm -hmm. They unfortunately are going to not have a good outcome, but they are forced with their final days without appropriate pain medicine and any really palliative support to, for the family and the child. Uh, and it's a very painful thing for me to experience in Pakistan. Um, somebody that I recently was, they had, so one, one of our main problems is because of the volume um, that we see, nobody really owns the cancer patients for, for their biopsies. And their biopsy in my hospital gets delayed by as much as two months. So somebody who came in walking and could possibly have been cured if they had been if treatment had started the day they started, they came in the hospital, a native patient two months later when they're biopsying that patient. And at that point, I was like, listen, why do we need to biopsy this, this lesion? What we need to talk about is how are we going to leave this family and this child with their final uh, moments? Okay, Sepel, you are the president of ASPA, Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists. And do you have any uh, ideas how the international societies can uh, help to achieve uh, universal coverage of high quality uh, cancer care in pediatrics? Uh, first of all, thank you, Nori, for uh, presenting this uh, webinar and organizing all uh, these. And thank you for Dr. Lucas uh, for uh, igniting the flame. I think it was before the uh, before the uh, pandemic that you had written something iterative anesthesia and has organized the first meeting in France. Uh, I think now uh, the group is enlarging. Uh, Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesiology has uh, every month webinars. Uh, and they have some subgroups like uh, pediatric pain and the sedation or other subgroups. So we are uh, giving some webinars, but I think uh, webinars are not enough. People are um, tired of listening to webinars or attending, so we have to reach them. Uh, but uh, world is in somehow big, somehow small, uh, through webinars and workshops, uh, online uh, meetings, we can reach each other, but we have to have hands-on uh, educations. Um, we need guidelines, policies, uh, and people to work. Uh, not only the anesthesiologists, the nurses, the anesthesia technicians we have in hand. So we have to, um, educate them as well. I think every people has something to do in this field. So we have to have some uh, teams like uh, dealing with these oncological patients. It's um, We can work with COP, like Dr. Lucas has um, just begun the team and the collaboration is increasing. Uh, so we, we should put the guidelines and then reach these people and the uh, cancer patients. Um, it's a very difficult, very touchy part of this uh, 
even premedication of these children or anesthesia of these children are neglected. Uh, they come and go and they're in their real world and they uh, see this as their normal. Uh, this is this is a pity. So the international organizations like WFSA has some safe peace courses or uh, small Asia or small train. We have some uh, charity organizations like that. We may have some uh, cancer anesthesiology uh, charities or uh, like smile, smile train. We may, we can make some organizations like that, which can travel and uh, see the what are the problems on site and then help people, uh, whatever their uh, conditions are. This is just the beginning. Thank you for putting this forward. Yeah, if you allow me just one word, I will, um, the WHO and um, the International Agency of, Atom uh, of Atomic Energy, the uh, IAEA, uh, actually is are working on some protocols or some standards in for radiation centers because they want to to amplify the spectrum of of these cares because they are of course aware that in many countries there are no radiation centers and they want to help to to in implementing these centers in certain countries and so they are building up some standards and uh, i was collaborating with them but now for a certain time i haven't got any uh news but uh perhaps some very well I, I might meet some of them quite soon and i will ask uh, about it if if there is anything uh new and i mean this is also one of the steps that can be done for uh and of course you remember a radiation center is in itself a very very expensive center which we were talking about money and uh, about means and i mean anesthesia is is just nothing compared to the to the amount of money which, which is needed for building up an, a radiation center but still anesthesiologists and radiation oncologists should go hand in hand because it is very surprising that oncologists or administratives uh, build up centers and just don't think about anesthesia. And so you find yourself in a center with no uh, recovery room, with no oxygen, with no aspiration syndrome, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this in Europe, not only somewhere in far in a country with low income. So it's really interesting, and I think we have to push forward for for red, making people more sensitive about this. Thank you. And uh, uh, we are sorry that we are uh, we come to the end of this enlightening webinar. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all our esteemed speakers, uh, attendees, our audience, and the organizations that made this event possible. The Joint Society, the uh, Joint Society of Pediatric Anesthesia, and the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists. Throughout our discussions today, we have witnessed the power of collaboration, innovation, and dedication to improving the care of our pediatric oncology patients. The insights shared by our distinguished panelists have illuminated the path forward, highlighting the pivotal role of anesthesia in pediatric cancer area. Each speaker has brought unique perspectives, experiences, and knowledge to the table, enriching our understanding the ideas exchanged to get today have the potential to make a profound impact on our lives of the children, uh, our uh, fragile children. Let us leave this virtual gathering inspired and motivated to continue our work, striving for better outcomes and embracing the spiral of continual impairment. The journey of improving anesthesia care for pediatric oncology patients is go ongoing. Our collective efforts are the driving force behind the positive change. I encourage everyone to carry the knowledge and insights gained here today into their respective fields, in their countries, in their hospitals they work. Let us continue to provide the best possible care to the youngest members of our society who look up to us uh, for strength and hope and help. Thank you once again for your participation, and I look forward to seeing the in transformative impact of discussions had here today in the future of pediatric cancer care. Until we meet again, stay inspired and committed to making difference. Goodbye and take care.